I'm going to start off with a presentation about structured elimination microscopy. And the, 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 the thrust of the presentation is to explain how Olympus is addressing the issue of super resolution, also high speed super resolution. Because what we've developed here is a system, of, a system for live cell sim microscopy. Most important though is just to explain how this is achieved because technologically overall there is improvement in signal to noise ratio imaging that will enable higher resolution microscopy than what has traditionally been obtained. So this is an example of super resolution in a HeLa cell and you can see on the, on the right side is a confocal image with a resolution of probably about 200 nanometers and on the left I'm sorry, on the left is about 200 nanometer confocal. On the right, we have a SIM image, which has about 120 to 150 nanometer resolution. Typical comments when people see these sort of things in their, with their work is that they will, have, they will observe phenomena or, or structure that they haven't seen before. So I want to make a few points up front about how the microscope is essentially an old man. And the microscope does not see small things. Uh, that, may, that may not be, seem like a problem, but the fact is that every, let's go back to this, every structure, no matter how large it is, has small features that will become blurred or, round, or, or lost by the microscope. And as you can see in the top, we have, we have large structures that appear rounded as, after they pass through the microscope. It's still, you still see white and you still see black. You know where things are and you know where things aren't, but the edges are not clear. When the, the spatial frequency or the structures become smaller, spatial frequency becomes higher, that rounding out becomes so severe that you no longer have contrast and you can't tell where structure is and where structure isn't. And that's the essential challenge that we have in microscopy. And what we're trying to do is get around that problem and do it fast so that we can have high speed, high resolution imaging. This is another, another example of SIM. So we have Widefield and, and SIM. This is from uh, Matt Gustafson's paper in 2000, demonstrating the technique when it was first presented. Here we have two uh, videos describing uh, EB3 that show the difference between the potential of a microscope as, it's, as it has traditionally been and with super resolution. You can clearly see an, an enhancement in our ability to, to, to perceive structure. Arabidopsis, a similar effect. So, microscopes are getting better. That's the exciting part of what, what, what I want to bring to you today. Okay, how do we describe this and what's the potential of the technology? What you can see here is a curve that describes large features on the left and small features on the right. And this curve tells us how well a microscope is able to transmit that information. For large features, we get 100% transmission and out at this thing we call 2FC, we don't see anything at all. Somewhere in between is what microscopes do. The red line is the behavior of a wide field microscope. Confocals are a little bit better, the green lines. As you close the pinhole down, you get more information. So you're able to reach further and further to this limit out here. The limit of the technology is two times whatever a wide field is. And that's what we're trying to get to with structured illumination. This symbolically represents how every microscope works, no matter what kind of microscope it is. And this was presented by Mats Gustafsson in 2000. And what it describes is structured illumination in its simplest form, where we overlay a sinusoid on the image. You see two, gr two, grills, two grates there that are a sinusoid. One of them is the sample, and the other is the structure. The two points in, in C are points that represent a discrete sinusoidal overlay in the in Fourier domain. The two circles that result in D show you the extra information that comes out of that imaging process. And it's these, this area here that is novel information about the sample. Unfortunately, what happens is that that novel information is overlaid on the old information, so you can't quite make the two out. They're not put in the right place. So computationally, you have to you have to take that information and separate it. And that's a slow process. It's also slow because you're only doing one wavelength, that one sinusoidal overlay at a time. So you have to do this many times. So we find ways to get around that and accelerate it. So this is another example of how this actually appears. In the upper left, you can see the microscope's view of a sample. It's not, it, this, is, this intensity plot tells you a spectrum, a spatial spectrum of, a, of an object. In, the, in, the, uh, in, in B, 
that's structured illumination. And you can see some flaring at about two o'clock and seven o'clock, it's extra intensity. That's, that's, the, that's the super resolution. That's that better than a wide field level of information that the microscope's able to produce. But you can see that's all combined. They're all superposed with one another. So now you've got to break it up into separate parts, rebuild something that's meaningful, and then transform it back into an image that has higher resolution. Slow process. So how does that information get there? This is a classic example of how we overlay grids on a, on a sample to show structured illumination. And, 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 and so first I want to pull out what the microscope sees. The microscope might see some structure, which is the red line, some structure, which is the black line. Now let's imagine the red lines are too close together to resolve. We can't quite make it out. But there's something in this image, and you might be able to perceive it, that's larger but related to the, to the structure of the red lines. And that would be the rivers that run in, in white here and here. So in this direction, there's some broad, broad structure that's easily transmitted to the microscope, which can be, through calculation, converted into something that describes these red lines. Here you can see the effect of rotating that grid. And you can clearly see there's something going on here that's got information in it that you can perceive. Your eyes are much more like the microscope, okay? You're, you can easily see these broad wave-like structures that are appearing vertically, but maybe the red lines are too far apart. If I told you that there was a mapping from those broad lines to the fine red lines, you begin to become interested. We can now, we can now capture that information. So we want to go fast. How do we do that? The top is a traditional SIM. It describes a stepwise process that requires a lot of calculation. The bottom is using structure. Now, you're, it's not an unfamiliar process. We do it all the time in a scanning confocal microscope, but here we're gonna use a different kind of point. We're gonna use the, the spinning disk. Why can we do this, and why can we model it the same way? It's because any structure can be broken down into a series of sinusoids. Everything can break down into a series of waves, so we can, it's the same process. Except, in this case, we run, we run the, the structure illumination, and we run it back through the same disk, and this process of demodulation is exactly the same process that the computer does slowly, but it happens optically and an instantaneous process, so we can flash the sample with a spinning disk and acquire back immediately a super resolution image. The challenge here, and the reason why this has not been done, is because it's, that super resolution information is very dim. So what does it take to get to the point where we can actually begin to work with it? And that's improved signal and noise level. We have to have more sensitive cameras, smart approaches to the way we sample, and better confocality and contrast. So there's an image showing you the super resolution capability. Here's another one breaking out how the features are less soft. You can definitely see more discerned, well-discerned structures. So let's look at how industry-wide this capability is being realized. Better optical matching, confocality contrast improvements, detector designs that help improve signal and reduce noise, proper sampling techniques, and mechanical stability. So from the bottom, I want to eliminate that right away. If you have a microscope that moves around, you're not going to see structures that are 80 or 100 or 150 nanometers in diameter. They're going to be lost in the blur that's created by the, the movement. Another thing that you have is you've got to make sure that you capture as much signal as possible. So how, how can you achieve that? Well, one thing you can do wrong is you can, you can pay no attention to spherical aberration. And if you do that, you're going to lose a lot of signal. The curve on the left shows the extent to which um, the full width half max or intensity can be, can be changed simply by suboptimal matching of, of your oil or your correction collar to the or poor correction collar setting. You want to be at a point where the oils match the sample. Silicone oils do this very well. And here you can see an example where we've imaged deeply into, a, into tissue and we have much higher contrast at depth when, used, when using the proper oil. And I can tell you from experience that if you don't have the correction color set, you're not going to see any super resolution. All that sim is gone. But if you get it matched correctly, it's great. Most people are not in the habit of reaching into their microscope and adjusting the correction color. It's completely new dynamic, something that we have to get used to. But we facilitate this by, allow, by creating a linkage out external to the microscope that you can easily turn to adjust the correction color. So now it becomes a, a way of manipulating 
that correction color. It'll help people become familiar with it. You optimize that, and you optimize your signal. We should be doing it always. Techniques that facilitate better confocality are extremely important as well. So in this case, we have old technology, new technology, compared uh, in this, uh, an X1 versus a W1. And by moving pinholes further apart, we get better confocality, less crosstalk. You can see the difference in the, in the images at depth. The bottom, this is an XZ, so we have deeper imaging with higher contrast. Why is higher contrast important? If our super resolution information is very, very, is very weak, we can't afford to have spurious fluorescence overlaying it. We need to have as much signal and as, as uh, the least noise possible to perceive that. This is a 100 micron stack of cleared mouse brain. This is something that would not have been very easily done on, on previous instruments, but because of the improved confocality, we're able to get much more depth without having crosstalk. Crosstalk being where, 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 the where the confocal microscope, the spinning disk breaks down. You can't go too deep or you, you, have, uh, you have intensity where it doesn't belong. So by moving apart, you can go much deeper into the sample. Detector architecture is very important as well. Uh, the red line on the top shows the SCMOS capability as compared to the green line, the EMCCDs, which have typically been, EMCCDs typically been the go-to camera for low intensity imaging. When you don't have a lot of photons, SCMOS is actually a better device, mainly because of the way the cameras work. For a, for a typical uh, uh, EMCCD device, this is actually mislabeled here, I should switch these around. You've got a transfer charge out of the camera, and every time you do this, the camera essentially goes click, 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 and it adds noise. Many fewer transfers of charge in an SCMOS camera, so you don't get as much added noise. That helps us. We want to translate all those benefits that we're getting across the industry into resolution, because that's what we really care about. So that's what we're trying to do. The last thing, I think this is the last thing, is we're properly sample sampling. Sequential acquisition. If you want to take a 100 millisecond ac acquisition, you can do it two ways. You can wait 100 milliseconds while your camera integrates, or you can take 10 discrete 10 millisecond ap uh, acquisitions. And what does that achieve? What it does is it averages, out any, it averages out any intrinsic noise to that acquisition process, cancels that out. So that's a smart way of acquiring. The next thing you want to do is you want to bin. If you don't need the resolution in XY, then bin to help reduce noise. Then your, your super resolution information will come up. And then we can process it and get higher resolution. The last thing, which is probably the most important thing and the tie into what you're familiar with, is sampling of the airy disk. Deconvolution is a part of this process because it's the only way to convert what is an airy disk that we don't understand, a bullseye, into something that we want to see, which is a point structure, an object in space that's a point. We have to remove that optical phenomena that converts small things into, into, air, into bullseyes. So how do we achieve that? We achieve it by, by first recognizing what we do wrong when we don't do this, <laughs> okay? So what we do normally is we take a 50 micron pinhole in a spinning disk and we project it through a 100X objective and we have a 500 nanometer polka dot on our sample. Right away that means anything smaller than 500 nanometers is not gonna be clearly resolved because whatever falls under, the, under that illumination area is one object as far as the microscope is concerned. So we get some airy disks out, and we look at the size of that airy disk compared to the camera pixels, and we know we have enough information to tell that there might be two objects there. There probably are two objects there, two discrete airy disks. But it's not very well sampled. Now, if we add magnification to the equation, what happens is our projected pinhole is only 220 nanometers, and that's resolution limitation. That's resolution limited excitation. Now we have high frequency stimulation of the sample, which is more likely to produce high frequency emission. So we're basically adding a hearing aid to the microscope so that the old man can hear. Okay, now we have the same two results, but we run that through magnification because it's the same optical train. We demagnify those pinholes, and then we magnify it on the way back out. And now you can look at the size of the airy disk relative to the pixels. We're really oversampling those airy disks. What's the benefit of that? Now we can see those rings, because those rings are the codification of, of high resolution that deconvolution can act upon 
and produce an excellent high resolution image at about 120 nanometers. So just to drive the point home, that's the sampling we want for super resolution or for, or for SIM. If we're ever gonna get to two times the ability of a, of a wide field microscope, we've gotta do this, okay? Processing step amplifies signal down here, tries to raise it up. It's already very weak, so this is a deconvolution. Simple Wiener filter, very simple, but very effective. And when we have good confocality, it's complete, completely justified. Here are some example images. You can see a wide field image, a deconvolved result. Now what happens if we let the microscope, let the optics do the work for us? We get a better result yet. So deconvolution is very good, but we should be working with the optics to do the calculation for us. And we can, we can do that now because we have overhead. We've got, we've got less noise. We have an opportunity. So we do it here. Okay. Another example showing, showing the resolution. You have to compare this to your experience to, to judge. Here's mitochondria. It's typically, I think it's a very good result for mitochondria. Now the most important thing, and just to wrap it all up, is why do we go through all this trouble? We go through this trouble because we want information from our investment. If we can get this, why would we want that? If we can get useful information, why would we want this? So that's the reason why we do structured elimination. So take advantage of the advantages, take advantage of the improvements in cameras, in optics, in matching for sphere collaboration, in, in ergonomics, to, over, over, to, to, to improve your end result in your data. Do you have any questions for me? Because I, I went really fast and I talked a lot. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.